Good afternoon, church. How are we doing? Hey, fantastic. It's great to see you. I don't know what you mumbled. It sounded very jumbled. But if you have your Bibles, we're in Hebrews chapter 9, although uh, it's going to take us a while to get there uh, because I wanted to focus today. Uh, you know, you come to church, and I don't know about uh, obviously all of your backgrounds. I know some of your backgrounds. Um, but I grew up um, in the church. Uh, and, and, and so from a very young age, I was able to uh, go to church and go to service and uh, hear the Word of God preached and proclaimed and able to worship. Uh, but there comes a time when you start interacting with people and you start meeting people and you start meeting people outside of the church. And uh, at least for me, I want to internalize, like, I want to see and feel. How are they feeling? How are they seeing the service? How are they perceiving our worship? How are they perceiving the word? And sometimes when I think about how an outsider coming into a church would look uh, at, at what we do when we worship and the words that we sing and the things that we preach and the communion that we partake in, um, if I was an outsider of the church, I would be pretty confused. Uh, we sing that there's power in the blood. Now, to us, yes and amen, and then to somebody who maybe walks in for the first time or doesn't have a church background, it's like, what are you talking about power in the blood? Or when we say that this is the broken body of Jesus and this is the shed blood of Jesus for us, 100% it is, but what do we mean by that? Or when we say baptism, what do we mean by baptism? Or when we say uh, covenant, right? We just saying that our God is faithful, the God of promises, the God of covenant. What do we mean uh, when we say these things? And so uh, today, as we look through our sermon series, From Creator to Father, uh, my hope is that we would look at the covenant of Jesus and the commitment of Jesus uh, and, and kind of explain some of these things. What do we mean by power? in the blood? What do we mean, the blood of the covenant? What do we mean um, when we talk about these things? And if you are a believer, if you are a Christian, my hope is that today uh, the Bible just clicks for you. Uh, like I'm going to attempt in 30 minutes to tell you at a very high level the story of the Bible. Because there is one story among those 66 books that talks about one God and that God redeeming people. Um, but we see in beginning, in Genesis, when God creates the world, he creates it perfect and good. And that God's relationship with man is secure. And God has a relationship with man. And then man sins against God and everything fractures. It's no longer good. It's now broken. And the relationship with God is no more because man has sinned against God. And Ephesians puts it this way, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins spiritually dead uh, physically dying that we were before Christ dead in our trespasses and sins and when sin entered the world it fractured this relationship between God and man and here's the story of the Bible the story of the Bible is God taking it upon himself to redeem creation all creation but specifically man and when we read through the Bible in that kind of lens, what we begin to see is five different covenants in the Bible. Now the word covenant means uh, a, a faithful promise. When we get married, we say not, hey, uh, if, you, if I come home and the house is clean and you've got food on the table, I'm going to be married to you. Or if I come home and there is actually a home and we have a house and there's this much in the bank account, then I'm going to be married to you. Nobody has ever said those kind of vows at their wedding. Nobody writes that out. Nobody even thinks that. But at the wedding, we do uh, say these vows and promises that whatever happens, I'm going to be with you. Whether for better or for worse, whether we're rich or poor, whether we're healthy or sick, no matter what happens, I'm staying with you. And the expectation in marriage and in the marriage covenant 
is that both of you would be faithful to the marriage covenant until the end. And when's the end? Until death do us part. We love those kind of weddings where we make those kind of promises, but we love even more the couple who actually lives it, who have been together for 50, 60 years and have made it faithfully together with that covenant that they promised. And in the Bible, we see God's relationship to people, and we see that God creates these covenants, these promises, with various people throughout uh, the history of the world. The first one that we see is uh, the Noahic covenant. The covenant that came through Noah. By the way, when we're talking about covenant, uh, we, there's always a mediator, a person for the covenant, and there's always a sacrifice or bloodshed for the covenant. And so in Genesis chapter 9, verse 8 and 11, after the flood has killed everybody, right? It's a beautiful Sunday, store, or Sunday school story where we have painted the rainbow and we have the water, right? But we don't really add the dead people floating in there, right? Right? We leave that part out for the kids. But that's the reality of the Bible. It's where God destroys man because of their sin. Afterwards, uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 8, Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And so God's first covenant that we see with man after sin is this Noahic covenant. And it's after God sees the increase of sin, he sees evil, and he says in people's hearts there's evil increasing, and it's increasing continually. It's all the time. There's just evil upon evil upon evil. And so God destroys Everybody and saves Noah and his family. And afterwards, God says, you know what, Noah? Here's the covenant I'm going to make with you. I will never destroy the world again by flood. And Noah is the mediator to the covenant. And he places the rainbow in the sky as a symbol, as a symbol, as a sign that when we look on it, we remember the covenant of God, that God has promised to never destroy by water. That's the first covenant that we see. A couple hundred years pass, and we get to the Abrahamic covenant. This is the covenant that came through Abraham. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 5 and 6, and he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven. He brought Abraham outside. You'll remember Abraham. Before he's Abraham, he's called Abram, and he has this thing where God has promised to him uh, offspring. God has promised him an inheritance, and yet Abraham has no children. Uh, Sarah is barren, and Abraham turns to God, and he goes, Lord, how can you promise these things when I don't even have an offspring and somebody in my house is going to take all my stuff once I pass away? And here's God turning to Abraham. He said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then God said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, Abraham believed the Lord, and God counted it to him as righteousness. And if we skip over uh, same chapter, but verse 17, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying to your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. God makes a covenant first with Noah And now, as the mediator, Abraham is this covenant. That God says, Abraham, through you, you will be my chosen people. Among all the different people, among all the different races, among all the different nations, you will be my people. 
God is redeeming uh, And through the Abrahamic covenant, we see the redemption of God until we pass uh, a couple hundred years, even further into the future, and we see uh, the Mosaic covenant. And that's in Exodus chapter 19, verses 4 through 8. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord God had commanded him. Uh, And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. Right? And so God speaks to the people of Israel after bringing them out of Egypt. God says, you will be my people, but more than that, you will be holy. Meaning you will be set apart. You're not going to be like the rest of the world. You're going to have your own sacrifice. You're going to have your own law. You're going to be a holy nation. You're going to be set apart and you're going to be following me. And here's God's promise that if you obey my words, if you obey my words, then you will see blessing. And if you disobey, then tragedies will happen. And this is the covenant that God makes. This is the Mosaic covenant. And Moses, as the mediator, brings that to the people of Israel and says, here's what God has said. God has said, this is his covenant with you. You're going to be a holy nation. And if we obey the Lord and we follow him, we will flourish. We will be blessed. Nobody can stand against us. But if we disobey, all we can expect is calamity. And the people said, yes, to all that God has said. And Moses takes that and he brings it to God. See, that's the role of the mediator. In the Noahic covenant, it's through Noah. In the Abrahamic covenant, it's through Abram. And in uh, the Mosaic covenant, it's through Moses. And it's this promise that not only are you going to be my people, but you will be set apart. You will be different. You will be holy. And the last one, um, or second to last really, that we see in the Old Testament is the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. And your house... This is to David, and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever in accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision. Nathan spoke to David. And this is God promising to David that, listen, through you, I'm going to establish a kingdom, and that kingdom is going to reign forever. So we see at the start, God begin to redeem people. After we have seen, after we have sinned, we see God be able to redeem people. And all these different covenants, these four covenants, they build upon each other. Right? So the first covenant is God just saying, hey, listen, I'm not going to destroy you. That's pretty good. Right? I'm good with that. Yeah. I'm not going to destroy you. And then Abraham. And you know what? You're going to be my people. I will be your God. You're going to have a relationship with me. You're going to be my people. More than that. Mosaic covenant. You know what? You're going to be holy, set apart. And then Davidic covenant. You know what? You're going to be an eternal kingdom forever. And then we get to Jeremiah. And here's what God says through the prophet Jeremiah. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. This is Jeremiah 31, verse uh, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke Though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. 
and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. This is the new covenant. This is the covenant that replaces the old covenant. This is the covenant that those old covenants were kind of pointing to. This is a covenant that is brought to us by Jesus Christ. This is the covenant that Jesus not only doesn't destroy us, but Jesus makes us his people, he makes us holy, and he makes us eternal and gives us an eternal life. Do you see how the Bible is one story? It's God's faithful redemption. God faithfully redeeming all people to himself. And in Jesus Christ, he says three things. I will put my law within them. I'm going to write it on their hearts. And listen, not only that, they're going to be my people and I will be their God. More than that. I'm going to forgive their sins and I'm going to remember their sins no more. Sometimes, you and I, we remember our sins and we remember the sins of others and God help us, sometimes we hold it against them. And here's what God says, all have sinned against me, but there comes a time when I will forgive their sins and I will remember their sins no more. It doesn't mean that God has no memory of us sinning against him, but it means that he doesn't hold it against us. And these three things, that God puts his law in our hearts, that we are his people, and that we are forgiven, these three things happen through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. These three things happen and they occur by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. Because it is the Holy Spirit who convicts us of sin. It's the Holy Spirit who reminds us of the righteousness of Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit who in our souls we cry out by the power, Abba, Father, we say He's our God. We know Him by the power of the Holy Spirit and it's by the Holy Spirit that we are forgiven of our sins because we have believed in the Lord Jesus and He has forgiven us our sins on the cross. All of that, the Bible says you were, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, the Bible says you were all baptized by one spirit into one body. By one spirit into one body. And it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, Jew or Greek, if you're a Gentile, it doesn't matter whether you're white or black or whatever, you are baptized into one body by one spirit. It's the unity of Jesus. That he creates place for all peoples to be gathered and reconciled to God. And that's made available to us through the new covenant that's found in Jesus Christ. And this covenant is now the perfect covenant. This new covenant does not have any additions. This new covenant does not have anything that uh, you know could be better. This new covenant is now perfect because of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. Here's what we see in the new covenant covenant. And so open up your Bibles uh, with me to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11. 
The first reason why this new covenant is perfect is because we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But when Christ appeared as a high priest, verse 11 of chapter 9, of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled uh, persons with the ashes of heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purifying our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And so here's what we read in Hebrews. That in the old covenant, they would offer animals as sacrifice for the sins. And really, um, they would offer uh, once a year in the most holy places, they would offer this sacrifice. And they would have to return because that does not forgive sin. That does not satisfy the wrath of God. And here's what the Bible says. If that was the old covenant. How much better is the new covenant where Jesus himself offers himself, his own blood, his righteous life as a sacrifice for our sins? Do we see why we sing that there's power in the blood? Do you see why, we, why it's so important that a sacrifice was made? Because the wages of sin is death. And somebody has to pay the penalty for sin. And it's either you or it's Jesus who has paid the penalty for that sin on your behalf. The redemption is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And here's what the Bible says, that Jesus not only deals with the flesh, not only with the sin that we see, but Jesus deals with our conscience. It says, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You know what Jesus said? Jesus said that if you want to get into heaven, your righteousness has to supersede that of the Pharisees. And the disciples were shocked. What do you mean? How can our righteousness supersede that of the Pharisees? They have the Torah memorized. They pray these loud and beautiful prayers. They give so that everybody can see. What do you mean our righteousness has to supersede that of the Pharisees? And what's Jesus talking about there? It's not about your external actions, but it's about the changing of the heart. Jesus changes us internally, and as a result, we are changed externally. Jesus changes us, and as a result, we live out our lives with good works. But Jesus is the one who is able to forgive us our sins in our conscience, in our very soul, in the inner person. Jesus redeems us, and the perfect covenant, the new covenant, redeems us not just externally, but it redeems our soul. The second reason uh, that this covenant is the perfect covenant is in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, there's one mediator. Therefore, he, being Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. So in the first covenant, there was sin, and in the new covenant, Jesus redeems us for the sin that was committed under the first covenant. Jesus is the mediator. It's not Noah, and it's not Abraham, and it's not Moses, and it's it's not David, and it's not a sinful man. It is Jesus Christ who is the perfect one, the holy one. That's why his sacrifice works. He is the new covenant. He is the mediator of the new covenant. And we see 
in verse nine or chapter nine, verse twenty-four, we see why Jesus is uh, the perfect mediator. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Uh, in the Mosaic covenant, they had established. Uh, the tent uh, and, and the tabernacle, and here's how it was established. You would uh, go in, and what you would see uh, after the court, you would come into the first uh, place, which is the holy place. And that's where uh, the priests would be, and that's where uh, sacrifices would be made. And then once a year, the great high priest would go into the most holy place, and he would offer sacrifice. And that was only allowed for one person to enter that most holy place. And he would offer sacrifices for himself. He would offer sacrifices for people. And here's what uh, the author of Hebrews just said. He said that Jesus has entered the holy place that's not made with hands. It's not of this creation. Jesus has entered heaven. Jesus has entered the most holy holy place and he appears in heaven in the presence of God and what's that last couple words there on whose behalf on our behalf Jesus has entered heaven into the most holy place into the heavenly places on your behalf so that when there's an accusation of sin Jesus is there saying I've paid for it really on your behalf Really, on my behalf? What kind of week did you have this week? How many accusations could be made? And yet Jesus is in the holy places on our behalf. Verse 25, Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priests enter the holy places every year with blood, not his own, For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, Jesus has appeared once for all at the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus does not continually have to enter uh, and get out of the holy place and enter the holy place. Jesus had to do it once. He lived a sinless life once and his sacrifice once was enough for all of us. It is the love of God in Jesus Christ where we see the fullness of that covenant. Where we see the completion of that covenant. That God has so loved you that he sent Jesus to die once for your sin. We have so much more power by the power of the Holy Spirit over our sin than we can even imagine. We have so much more power to overcome, so much more power to walk in holiness. We're blinded to it because we don't see ourselves in the new covenant. My hope is that we do see ourselves in the new covenant that we see ourselves cleansed by Jesus, that we know that Jesus is there and that he's interceding for us, that he's the mediator. Because for a covenant to work, you must be found faithful. We see the people of Israel in Moses' covenant and it's failure after failure and a repentance and then restoration and then failure after failure. In the new covenant... We see perfection because our mediator is perfect. And his sacrifice is perfect once and for all. Do we see ourselves in that new covenant? Not as the people we were, not as the sinners we were, but as those redeemed uh, by Jesus. And lastly, the result of this new covenant is eternal life. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. See what the author of Hebrews there did? He's going, this priest is standing there, and he's offering sacrifices, and he's doing it repeatedly, and it can never take away sin. 
But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And what's he waiting for? He sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all times those who are being sanctified. You know who's being sanctified? You and me, constantly, by the Holy Spirit in us. We can all point at our lives, if you're a believer, and go, haven't nailed it, but I'm not who I was. I see the work of the Holy Spirit in me. And it's a lot of stumbling forward, and it's a lot of getting back up, and it's a lot of following Jesus, and it's a lot of repentance, and it's a lot of tears, and it's a lot of forgiveness, but I'm going forward. For by a single offering, Jesus has perfected those who are being sanctified. That you are, in the eyes of God, accepted because of Jesus Christ. That you are in the eyes of God, righteous because of Jesus Christ. That you are, in the eyes of God, perfected because of Jesus Christ. As we are being sanctified. The new covenant, Jesus not only, Jesus gives us life. He doesn't just save us from death. He doesn't just not destroy us. Jesus gives us life and Jesus calls us his people and Jesus makes us holy and Jesus gives us an eternal kingdom. And all of that happens when we believe because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In three weeks from now, you're gonna have, uh, we're going to have one church service and we're going to have a baptism service. We uh, have historically done this once a year. Now we're switching to two, uh, twice a year. And you're going to see people uh, that have, are going to make a proclamation uh, because in the Bible we see two types of baptisms. We see the baptism of the Holy Spirit and we see uh, the baptism with water. Uh, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens when a person believes. right? So when a person repents and believes, they receive the Holy Spirit and they're automatically baptized into one body, into one spirit. They are already the church. Salvation happens when you repent and believe. When Peter is done preaching in Acts chapter 2, the people People ask him, what shall we do? And Peter in Acts chapter 2.38 says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of the sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not you might, not if tongues falls on you. No, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit when we repent and we believe and then we show through water baptism, I have believed in Jesus Christ and I am devoted to serving him with a good conscience. And that's happening three weeks from now. Those people aren't being saved three weeks from now. They're already saved. But three weeks from now, they're making a proclamation. Right? And so we need to understand these things. We need to see the covenant of Jesus and like I said, every single covenant has a sign, right? Noah has the rainbow. Uh, Abraham has circumcision as his sign. Uh, the, Mose uh, the Mosaic uh, covenant has the law um, and the tabernacle as their sign. And the Davidic covenant has the kingdom as their sign. So what is the sign for the new covenant? Well, it could be... Uh, a couple different things, right? Like, like I was thinking about what is the sign for the new covenant? Well, it could be the cross, right? The cross of Jesus Christ. Every time we look at the cross, you remember Simeon's prophecy about Jesus? Uh, Simeon prophesied that Jesus would be a, uh, a symbol opposed, right? So maybe the cross where the blood and the sacrifice was poured out, or maybe it's us, Maybe we're the sign because the Holy Spirit is in us. But I think a more perfect sign is the communion table. In Luke chapter 22, verse 19 through 20, 
Uh, and Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This broken body and this cup poured out, this is the new covenant. Every church has their traditions when it comes to communion. Um, Every church has their little nuances when it comes to communion. Uh, And I really like how we approach the Lord's table. Because we can clearly see the bread that's broken, and we can clearly see the cup with the blood symbolizing the blood of Jesus Christ. And here's what we know, that when we approach the Lord's table, the only reason that we're allowed to come near, the only reason that we're allowed to approach is because of the blood of Jesus Christ that was poured out on our behalf. And when we come towards the Lord's table, what we do is we remember That we are not part of the old covenant, but we are part of the new covenant. What we remember is that we are saved because of the blood of Jesus Christ that was poured out for us. And so church, let's stand and I'm going to invite the pastors up here. And we're going to partake in communion together.